This is the Parenting ADHD Podcast with Penny Williams. Each week, Penny shares proven ADHD parenting strategies and her hard-won ADHD mama wisdom. This is not your physician's podcast. Penny discusses the genuine grit of the moment-by-moment peaks and valleys of this special parenthood. It's time to beat the chaos and challenges of raising a child with ADHD. Here's your host, Penny Williams. Hello, parents. Welcome to this episode of the Parenting ADHD podcast. I'm really, really excited about my topic for today, that behavior is just a symptom. So often we as parents look at behavior as a problem. The behavior is the problem. And so we're trying to solve the behavior. And what Ross Green, um, the author of The Explosive Child and more recently Raising Human Beings, um, says to us is that the behavior is not the problem that we need to solve. It's really just a symptom of an underlying problem. And that underlying problem is what we need to be focusing on and what we are trying to solve. And I want you guys to really think about that because this is a super powerful perspective and it will make a huge difference in your parenting, in your family dynamic, um, in the amount of joy that you have in your home and in your family. This is really, really important. And so I want you to focus very closely on this conversation that I'm going to have with you today. Um, So as I said, behavior is a symptom. Behavior is not the problem. And this totally flies in the face of how we look at behavior from our kids as parents, right? We're taught that good behavior is rewarded and, quote, bad behavior is gets a punishment or a consequence, right? And and we grow up that way. And so we think that we should raise our own children that way. And it's not that that is um, a bad parenting approach, that it's the wrong parenting approach. You know, I don't want us to turn around to our parents now and say, you're doing the wrong thing, because that's not true necessarily, you know. I was a neurotypical kid. I did pretty well in school. Um, and so, you know, traditional parenting worked okay for me. And that's just fine. And it could have worked okay for you as well. But it really doesn't work. It's not successful for our kids with ADHD or kids with high functioning autism. So we have to really throw out that rule book as I've talked about many times before, the traditional parenting rule book needs to go in the trash. If you have paper copies of one, put them in the trash can. If you have a mental note, a mental guidebook of traditional parenting, throw it out of your mind. You have to start over and you have to create a whole new plan specific to your child and your child's needs. And we've talked about this many times before, and we'll continue to talk about it because it really is that crucial element that makes or breaks effective parenting for kids with ADHD. And so let's go back to this idea that behavior is only a symptom. Let me give you an example. My son might come to me and be very angry and super disrespectful, won't talk to me, uh, might be throwing things or breaking things, um, and just really ugly to me. Um, And, uh, you know, our traditional parenting intuition is that that's bad behavior, and that we have to change that behavior. You know, my child can't disrespect me. I'm the parent, right? That's what we're thinking in those moments. And the trouble with that thought pattern is that 
really the disrespect is not the problem. The problem is what led to the disrespect. The disrespectful attitude is only a symptom of something else. And your job is to be the detective to figure out what is that a symptom of. So in my son's case, um, when he's disrespecting lately, which doesn't happen a lot, but of course it's going to happen. He is a kid. He's a teenager. Um, you know, life is hard sometimes, and it's even more hard when you have ADHD, learning disabilities, high-functioning autism. And so for him, that disrespect isn't him sitting down and saying, I just really want to be ugly to my mom. That doesn't happen. That Our kids do not think that way. So what happens is something has triggered this very emotional intensity that is causing him to lash out. So that behavior of being disrespectful is not the problem, right? The problem is whatever led to that emotional intensity that then led to the disrespect. So for my son, a lot of times it is poor frustration tolerance that leads him into kind of this pit of emotional intensity that he's swirling the drain in. And when I try to intervene to help him, once he's already in the pit and swirling uncontrollably is not helpful. And what happens is he lashes out at me because when I try to talk to him, when in those moments, he's already um, beyond saturated. His brain is flooded. He cannot um, tolerate or process anything that I want to say to him. So no matter what calming skills we have in those moments, it's too late. They're not going to help. All that's going to help is to let him work through those emotions, let them dissipate, and then talk about how to solve that underlying problem at another time when he's calm. You know, that's the other really important tip here is that while behavior is just a symptom, we cannot solve the symptoms or the underlying problems in the heat of the moment. And I want you to think about what your brain is like, what your emotions are like when you're in the heat of a moment like that. You know, our cognitive functioning, our brain functioning, our reasoning is foggy and clouded and less able to function appropriately. Um, Emotional intensity will make us less reasonable, less realistic. So those are not the times to solve problems. Those are the times to offer your child whatever they need to work through that emotional intensity and get to the other side. Um, For my son, a lot of times that is leaving him alone. Um, My issue lately with that has been that he has been deciding to Um, destroy property. um, And his rationale for that is that he's not hitting someone. He's not hitting something. He's just tearing some things up as a release of that anger and frustration. And of course, destroying property is still not an acceptable way to show your anger and frustration. And so that's obviously something that we're working on. But what we have to work on in those instances is what is causing these emotional outbursts. And that is usually for him, um, poor frustration tolerance skills. He's always had poor frustration tolerance and we have been working on it for years and we will continue to for quite some time, I'm sure. And I think, you know, it's probably going to be something that he has to work on for his entire lifetime, you know, to get more mindful of his emotions and what 
kind of reactions they cause in him and be mindful of what tools he has to calm himself in those times, what tools he has to problem solve. So, you know, a lot of what I work on with him is instead of being emotionally reactive, let's try to solve the problem. First, take a breath and let's work on that underlying problem that this behavior is a symptom of. And so, you know, that's just one example. My child or your child being disrespectful, lashing out, that's just one example of a behavior symptom. There are so many. Um, Refusing to do homework or refusing to do classwork in school, that's a symptom. That is not the problem. And it's really hard. I know some of you right now are thinking that I have lost my mind, that of course, your child refusing to do their work is a problem. Yes, it's a problem. It's not the problem. It is not what you need to solve. Instead, what you need to solve is what causes that behavior. And so, This is a lot of asking why, constantly, constantly asking why. And this goes back to um, what I talked about with Brian King, the compassionate dad in a previous podcast, um, what I have talked to Sarah Wayland about in some of our podcasts on behavior is communication. It's to be a student of your child, be a detective. Your job as a parent of a kid with ADHD and or high functioning autism is to constantly learn more about them, specifically their needs, their strengths, their weaknesses. And in order to do that, you have to ask why, and you have to ask why constantly. It is a constant, never ending process to be looking for the reason behind behavior. And that reason that's leading to the unwanted behavior, that's your problem that you need to solve, not the behavior. And, you know, I really want you guys to practice this. Maybe write this down. Behavior is only a symptom or behavior is just the symptom and put it on your bathroom mirror or something. Put it where you're going to see it frequently. Maybe your phone screensaver, um, your computer screensaver and really Make it so that this is an ingrained idea for you, that you are constantly thinking, this is just a symptom. What is the actual problem? Let's ask why. Let's figure out the actual problem. Because the only way you're going to create change is to figure out the actual underlying problem and work to solve or improve it. And, you know, Often when we talk about changing behavior, we talk about punishment or consequences, and I'm not suggesting that there's never any punishment or consequence for kids with ADHD. That's not reasonable. That's not realistic. You know, sometimes they are going to make willful decisions like any other child their age. But it's all those other instances that are more than their neurotypical peers, that you need to be asking why and you need to be solving problems. Those are the ones that are related to their ADHD, their weaknesses. Um, and, you know, you, you use strengths to overcome weakness. So you use strengths to address these underlying problems and work to improve them. So say in the example that your daughter is refusing to do her homework. Now that refusal is not the problem. It's a problem, but it's not the problem. What is the problem? What is the reason that she is refusing to do her homework? And that could be a myriad of things, right? 
Maybe the assignment is overwhelming. Maybe she doesn't know how to get started. Um, maybe the idea of 20 algebra problems on one page makes her want to cry and scream. Um, maybe she has a learning disability that has not been identified yet. And so the homework that she's being asked to do is really outside of her capability. Um, Maybe she's hungry or tired. Maybe she's had a really bad day and she's just entirely too emotional today to do this work. You know, there are so many different potential underlying problems for refusal to do schoolwork. And, you know, if I punish my son one day because he refuses to do his homework, I say, okay, well, you have no screen time today then. There's none of it. No time with your friends, no screen time, no video games. Um, did that solve the reason why he doesn't want to do his homework? Well, if it's just to have more screen time, then yes, I guess that would be a solution. But most of the time, that is not why, because he wants to do well. He wants to do well in school. He wants his teachers to recognize how smart he really is. He wants to do what's expected of him. So what is the barrier there that's causing him not to? And in these cases with homework and schoolwork, it could be so many things. And we've just talked about a few possibilities. But what has to happen is that you have to be a detective and you have to figure out what is the underlying problem that's causing this behavior. Um, I often recommend for our parents to ask schools to do a functional behavior assessment, um, especially when behavior is a problem at school. I talk to a lot of parents whose kids are constantly suspended um, in school or out of school. Whenever their behavior is a problem, they're sent home. Um, and that is really the worst thing you could do. You know, if you send my son home, he is doing a happy dance. He is thrilled. And what have you taught him? You've taught him that if he has this certain behavior, he gets to go home. Um, back when he was in elementary school, third grade, almost every morning, he would fake throwing up in the classroom and try to get sent home because the first couple of times it worked. We all believed that he was sick to his stomach and I picked him up. He got sent home from school and he got to come home. And so that became a very learned behavior very quickly because it worked. Um, it got him what he really wanted was to escape that environment that's so difficult and painful for him, which is school. You know, think about how hard our kids work to try to fit at school, to try to meet the expectations at school. Because when your child is in fifth grade, their teacher is expecting them to meet fifth grade expectations. Their peers are expecting them to act like a fifth grader. The whole school environment for them is patterned after the expectations of a fifth grader. But your child has ADHD and it's a developmental disorder. So they have developmental dis delays. They have skill delays. And so your child is probably more like a second or third grader stuck in a fifth grade environment with fifth grade expectations that they cannot achieve. Think about that for a minute. Think about what that would feel like for six or seven hours a day, five days a week for nine plus months out of the year. Imagine what that feels like. And then our kids come home and they don't want to do homework. And we want to freak out because you have to do homework. I had to do homework when I was a kid. You have to do homework too. But let's really think about why they're freaking out, why they're refusing, because that behavior is only a symptom. What is it a symptom of? Well, it's a symptom of the fact that the expectations are too high for our kids 90% of the time because people don't understand them. Um, 
it's a symptom of the fact that they're spent by homework time. They're spent. They have just used up all of the energy they could possibly muster trying to meet expectations and fit in in school for six or seven hours of the day. They don't have anything left to give. You know, I mean, it just really makes sense when you think about it in those terms. When you try to put yourself in your child's shoes and figure out what is instigating the behaviors that you're wanting to change. Again, the behavior is the symptom. What is the problem? Um, And so then once you have that problem, you've identified it, you're now working on the problem, you're working on actually being able to affect change. And that is very important. Because the more you work on that behavior, the less effective you are going to be because changing the behavior only happens if you change the underlying reason for it, if you address the problem. So Ross Green teaches a collaborative problem-solving approach. And I think now that he's changed the name or the label of it a little bit, but the approach is exactly the same. And that is basically that you collaborate with your child to come up with solutions for problems that work for everyone involved. So this is not giving in to your child, um, you know, because as parents, we are really not here to be dictators. This is not supposed to be an authoritarian relationship. Our job as parents is to raise kids who can be happy and successful and contributing adults, right? I mean, our whole job is to mold the adult that they are going to turn out to be. Our job is not to have all the control and dictate every moment of our kids' lives. It's not. And it doesn't work for kids with ADHD, high-functioning autism, um, behavioral and conduct disorders. It just doesn't work because you're trying to push your will on your child. And Green talks about that a lot in his newest book, Raising Human Beings, is that it's not, parenting is not to implement your will on your child. It's to help your child discover who they are and how they can be successful and help them craft a life that is going to be positive, that's going to be joyful, successful, fulfilling, you know, right? I mean, isn't that what we want as adults for ourselves? That's the goal for every human being. And so, you know, how do you get there? Well, it's not by dictating what we expect our kids to do. It's not by saying, I'm the parent, so I have the control, and I don't care what you think. What I say goes, right? And a lot of us were raised that way. And that's a very traditional parenting perspective. Um, And again, you have to throw that away. You have to cast it aside. Get it out of your mind. Start fresh with a different approach that's going to work for your child. And solving behavior is really solving problems that cause behavior. Um, I want to kind of reiterate to you how super powerful this will be. And let me tell you, moving from kind of this authoritarian relationship with your child into a collaborative relationship is going to have a lot of growing pains. It's going to be difficult. Please, please, please do not decide that a collaborative approach doesn't work for your family because it didn't work the first time or the third time or the fifth time. It's a process for everyone to learn how to work together, how to change the whole dynamic of your relationship. And so basically, the collaborative problem 
uh, collaborative problem solving process is that you identify the problem, right? You have the symptom that is the behavior. You work to identify what the problem is. Now you have that problem. You know what um, is causing that unwanted behavior. And so now with the problem identified, you... um, you work with your child to come up with solutions. You're working together to come up with solutions. You're not imposing your will on your child. You are asking your child, what do you think is going to work for you? And that's another really important point for parents of kids with ADHD. We don't ask our kids for their insights often enough, if ever, Right. And sometimes it's, well, my kid's six years old. How is he going to know what he's struggling with? How is he going to know how to really communicate that to me effectively? You'd be surprised. Ask the question. Ask your kids, hey, what's going on with you? I noticed that you're really angry today, or I noticed that you're having a problem getting homework done. What's going on? Why is this a problem for you? Could they say, I don't know? Of course, of course. And a lot of times they don't know, or a lot of times they have an idea, but they don't know how to communicate it to you. Or sometimes we ask, how can I help you? Which is my favorite magic phrase that I teach parents. And that often helps with the behavior, the symptoms, the emotions, But often kids, especially younger kids, don't know what the solution is. They don't know what's going to help them. They just know that they're overwhelmed, they're emotional, they're intense, they're stuck in the muck. And they look to you for the help of how they're going to get out of that muck. What is going to help them to be able to move forward and to feel better and to do better? Um... But the first thing, always, always ask your child for their input. Ask them why they think something's happening. Ask them if they know what might help them. You know, my son has dysgraphia. It's super hard for him in school. He's in ninth grade. His handwriting is basically a four-year-old. Um you know, he has no sentence structure, his capitalization and punctuation is all over the place if it exists at all. Um, You know, the the sentences often aren't complete, you know, not just his handwriting, but his written expression is um, disabled, you know, it's a learning disability. And so, you know, for many years, I have imposed on him what I think would help. Hey, let's get you... um, an alpha smart, which is the little word processor that they often use um, in elementary school for kids for assistive technology, or let's get you using a computer in the classroom, or, you know, let's have you take a picture of the assignment written on the board. And let's make sure you have an iPad and you just need to quit working on paper altogether. You know, I think the iPad is going to be the best thing for you. But I didn't ask him. I didn't say, hey, what do you think is going to help you, Betty? What do you think is going to work for you? And that is a huge oversight on the part of parents. And I'm guilty of it. You know, I just sat here and admitted to you. I'm totally guilty of it too, but I'm working on shifting. And I have been for a while. Um, in shifting to ask him what he thinks is going to help him before I throw out my ideas in relation specifically to his learning disabilities in school. I'm just now starting to transition to asking him for more of his input and his ideas because now he's in high school. We have, you know, three and three quarter years left to shift the advocacy entirely from me to entirely him. You know, he has to learn now how to vocalize what he needs, how to vocalize what he's having a problem with. And so, you know, for those parents of little kids who are elementary age, 
when we talk about behavior as just a symptom, you're really going to have to be a detective more often than not to figure out what that underlying problem is. For those of us with older kids, preteens and teens, we need to think more about asking our kids what the problem is, asking them what's going to help. And we can certainly facilitate, we can throw out ideas, we can um you know, discuss and brainstorm their ideas and what might work or not work about them. You know, again, it's a collaboration. We have to look for our child's input. We have to have our own input. And then we have to put it together to come up with a plan or a solution that works for both of us. So it's not our child saying, well, I need to not do homework because it's too hard for me. And, you know, it's not then our job because we're collaborating and we're asking for their input to say, okay, well, if that's what you need, because that's not realistic, right? That's not a solution that works for us as parents. It's not a solution that works for their teachers, And so the collaborative problem solving process is that you look at the needs of the child, you look at the needs of the parents or the teachers, and then you work together to meld this information into something that works for everyone. And it's not necessarily compromise either. You're not compromising your standards. You're making sure that your expectations are appropriate for your child where they are developmentally. And you're making sure that their needs are met and that they feel heard and understood, and their input is valued. Because in that dynamic of the relationship, they're going to come to you more, they're going to ask for your help more. And the more that they ask for our help, when problems arise, the less we get to the point where behavior is a problem, where we're seeing the symptoms of the unsolved problems. Instead, we're teaching them by collaborating to come to us and and ask for help, to come to the parent and ask for help, to come to the teacher and ask for help, because we're showing that we're going to help them and we're going to value their input. We're going to listen and value their input And we're going to come up with something that works for them too. We're not imposing our will. We're not making commandments and expecting them to say yes, ma'am, or yes, sir, and follow suit because that just doesn't work. And I want to be very clear here. You know, I have certainly said that the collaborative problem solving process is the brainchild of Ross Green. You know, everything that I teach parents comes from another expert, someone else's advice, or from my own experience in experimenting with what works and doesn't work. So basically, I've done the research, I've pulled all the best nuggets from all of these other experts, and I've pulled from my own experience and kind of put together parenting approaches and strategies and systems that really work for kids with ADHD and for their parents, for the families. You know, I think a lot of times experts, especially those who don't have any kids with ADHD, don't have ADHD themselves, they don't know um, the implementation. They're not aware of the actual dynamic of whether that's going to work or not. And I don't want to dismiss experts that don't have personal experience with ADHD because they definitely have a lot of value to add. But what I'm saying is that, you know, my perspective, what I'm teaching you and other parents is kind of a conglomeration of a lot of the experts' um, input, a lot of their advice and strategies. And I have pulled it together in a way that I feel like will work for most parents 
kids and families who deal with ADHD. And so this idea that behavior is just a symptom is certainly not my own idea, but I see the power behind it. I see the value in it. And I want to be sure that every parent of a kid with ADHD understands this concept and is able to implement it with their own family. So, you know, think about a lot of the different behaviors. When you're going through your day with your child and a behavior problem crops up, I want you to take a breath a deep belly breath in, take five seconds or so to blow it out. Um, what we talk about with our son in belly breaths, calming breaths is to pretend you're blowing bubbles. If you blow it out too hard or too fast, your bubble is going to pop. You're not going to make a bubble. So I want you to take a belly breath, pretend that you're blowing bubbles out for a few seconds, and then have the clarity to say to yourself, okay, this behavior is a symptom. What is the problem? And you, of course, are going to remain calm because we all know that that is paramount. And you're going to start looking for the underlying problem. And then you can start changing these behaviors, these symptoms of unsolved problems, because you're going to start solving them. And you may only start improving them. You know, perfection doesn't exist. And for those of us with anxiety, that's a really hard concept to accept and internalize that there is no such thing as perfection. You know, um, I've been listening to this life coach, Brooke Castillo, and she modifies the saying of practice makes perfect and says practice makes progression. And that's what we're after. We're after moving forward, moving into some improvement. We cannot change our children's brains. They were born with a brain that functions in an ADHD manner. You know, they have the brain that has creates those symptoms, inattention, impulsivity, emotional intensity, um, so many other things. And we cannot change that. I cannot change my son's physiology. I can help him each day by giving him ADHD medication. And that helps him to be a little more available for strategies for problem solving. But I can't change who he is. So I have to figure out how to work with that, right? I have to figure out how to make it better, how to get to the best functioning under those circumstances that we can create for our kids. And part of that, a very powerful piece of that, is seeing that behavior is only a symptom of something else. Behavior is not the problem. It is a problem in your here and now when it's happening, but it is not the problem. So certainly visit the show notes page for this podcast. I would really encourage you to share in the comments the behaviors that you're struggling with and what problems you think they signal, or maybe you're really stumped and you just can't figure out what underlying problem might be attributed to a particular behavior. Share that in the comments. I will answer every single comment you leave. I will certainly give you as much insight or ideas or brainstorming as I could possibly provide to you with my own knowledge and experience. And what I always find so helpful and have since the day my son was diagnosed nine years ago is 
the experiences of others. When you're there, answer some of the other parents and they're going to answer you as well. Somebody else might be going through the exact same behavior and have just figured out the trigger for their child. And it could be the same trigger for your child or it could be that that ignites an idea for you of what is happening for your child, what the real problem is. So I encourage you to really go to this episode page, share your thoughts, share your struggles, um, share the behaviors that you are seeing now as symptoms and ask for input on what the problems might be. And of course, ask me questions. I'm more than happy to answer and help you. That is what I'm here for. So just to wrap up and reiterate this super important, powerful parenting approach, behavior is a symptom. Behavior is not the problem. Adjust your thinking, get your mind right, for solving problems instead of reacting to behavior. I will see you on the next episode. Thanks for listening to the Parenting ADHD Podcast with Penny Williams. If you like what you just heard, be sure to subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher. Visit the website, parentingadhdandautism.com for so much more on successfully raising kids with ADHD. Be sure to check out the podcast section as well for previous shows. Join us next time for more parenting strategies and insights that actually work for kids with ADHD.